Hey, what's going on everybody? This is Dylan with Magical Cams. And in this video, I'm going to be showing everybody how I made a super metal DIY lay bin cart for my female panther chameleons. Before we get into the video, I just want to take a moment to let everybody know that over 94% of this channel's viewers are not subscribed. So if you wouldn't mind grabbing that subscribe button, it would be really, really helpful to help this channel grow. Also, if you find this video to be entertaining or helpful or even inspirational, then go ahead and give it a like. By liking this video, you're really helping get it spread across YouTube so that anybody else looking for some ideas or inspiration on any of their reptile projects can find this video. And without any further ado, let's go ahead and get into the build. Let's start with a sick origin story of how the idea of this Laban cart came to fruition. It all started the day my beloved Laban decided to do a dye. After one of my gorgeous Ankfi girls laid an infertile clutch, I had to move the Laban that she just used. Unfortunately, I had forgotten how heavy this thing was, and I ended up dropping it and cracking it. Anyway, a few days had passed, and I had been mourning the loss of my precious Laban. In order to process and truly deal with the grievance that was eating away at my very soul, I decided to throw down some tasty licks on the drum kit. After a sweet drum sesh, I started to feel extraordinarily ill, and I didn't know what was wrong with me. Despite having overcome my sorrow, other troubles befell me. I decided to make my way over to the ER whilst not being completely burned alive by the sun and saw a doctor. The moment he placed eyes on me, he knew something was up. He looked at me and said, you look ill. In response, I explained the situation. The doctor leaned over and pierced my soul with this look in his eyes. And he said, I was sick once. Looks like you have a fever. I exclaimed, what? How do I fix it, doctor? And you know what he told me in response? The doctor told me, the only prescription is more metal. At first, I thought the most logical solution to my illness, to my fever, would to be making the cams more metal. And after brainstorming some ideas, I found that to be rather futile. And then it dawned on me. It's no coincidence that I came down with this fever at the same time that I broke the lay bin. But the one issue that I was still having was figuring out how to integrate both of these ideas into one simple project. So then I was like, oh, they have these things, and those things make things easy. What I mean by this is that there's these little cart things that movers use or, you know, people in workshops use to move heavy things around so that they don't drop them like I dropped the lay bin. So I was like, I'm going to make one of these, essentially. Just bear with me here, and I promise in a little bit, this will all make a lot more sense. I went to the store and picked up a new Laban that wasn't cracked, and then took some spare pieces of lumber and started making my measurements. To avoid doing some rather challenging math, I set the wood up next to the new plastic bin. I'll essentially be making a base cart and then putting a shell around it, and in order to ensure that my measurements were correct, I stacked the complete height of the wood up next to that bin. Since the bin tapers, meaning that it's wider at the top than it is at the bottom, it was a lot easier to do things this way than trying to take a bunch of measurements and then putting some guesswork into it. I did make sure to add about an inch to each of these measurements so that I would have enough wiggle room in case anything went awry. And following that, I took this fancy invention that they made called a pencil and marked my lumber accordingly. 
I took all of my fancy schmancy pine wood. Pine's not that fancy. But I took it all to the, uh, you know, the table saw. And you might be saying, a table saw, dude? Really? I don't have one of those. And that's okay. Because you could also do this with a circular saw or a jigsaw or even a hand saw if you feel so inclined to and want a good workout. But if you do have a table saw, I highly suggest making yourself a miter sled like you see me using here. It makes cross cuts like the ones you see here very, very simple and ensures that each of those cuts is nice and square. If you're feeling real lazy and don't wanna make one of these, then you can use the miter gauge that comes with the table saw. However, those tend to be very inaccurate. So I would actually take some sort of framing square or similar to ensure that that miter gauge is square with the saw blade. Once the two by fours were cut, I then utilize my pocket hole jig. I've used this pocket hole jig in a number of other videos on the channel, so I won't explain it here as there's a lot of other content that I need to get to in this video, but if you're curious on this method, then go ahead and look up another YouTube video on the subject. I will say that by using pocket holes, you're going to create a lot stronger joints between the wood. Alternatively, you could use some regular wood screws and butt joint the lumber together. And once all these pieces of lumber were screwed together, I used my tape measure to ensure that everything was nice and square. I don't know about you, but when I'm doing projects and I start to see my ideas materialize, I get super excited. So it was at this point that I went over to my computer and rendered a 3D image of what I'm creating. By getting the first part of this frame built and measured out, I then had the foundation for what to build the rest of the project off of. And another reason I decided to render a 3D image of this cart that I'm making is because in that program, I can actually measure out the pieces of lumber that I'm planning to use to make sure that everything that I'm cutting is the right size. There's nothing worse than cutting a bunch of lumber only to find out that it's the incorrect length. That is just super defeating. So yeah, as previously mentioned, now that I had the 3D image of my Laban cart rendered, I could then measure out each piece in the program to figure out what size to cut the rest of the lumber. I then went back to the table saw and cut the rest of the two by fours for the bottommost layer of the cart and then plywood for the floor of the cart. I'm not sure why I've not mentioned it yet, but if uh, you're making this project and you wanna stop at this point and call this a cart and just use the plywood and the two by fours instead of doing an outer shell, then go for it. But if you've watched any of my videos, I like getting real crazy with my projects and I like to have an object that I'm proud of and that I can have for years and years to come. With that being said, I then took my three quarter inch lumber that I'm using for the outer shell and cut it to length. For the larger of these shell pieces, that will be attached to the side of the cart, I beveled three out of four sides of each to 45 degrees, making sure that the bottoms of these pieces were not beveled. For the smaller of the shell pieces that will be going on top of the cart, I cut one of the outside edges to a 45 degree bevel, and then each end of them got a 45 degree miter cut. And all this will make sense in a second if you are unsure of what I mean with all of these technical terms. So here in the video, you can see the top portion of the shell and how it's angled. And in this part of the video, you can see how the pieces of lumber for the sides are angled. And hopefully this kind of gives you a little bit better idea of how these pieces are all going to fit together in the grander scheme of things. The next part was to finish constructing the 
foundation or the frame of this Laban cart. I assembled the very bottom layer of 2x4s using the same pocket hole method as the top. However, instead of these 2x4s being upright so that the widest of the faces is facing outward, I laid them flat so that those widest faces would face downwards and upwards. From there, I took the plywood floor and put it on top of those 2x4s that I had just assembled. I then made markings on the plywood 3.5 inches in from all sides. The 3.5 inches is the width of the 2x4s underneath that plywood. These markings will act as a guide so I know exactly where to install my screws when putting this thing together. Once those markings were made, I removed the plywood and got the first part of the frame that I initially made in this video and set that on my workstation. I then grabbed that piece of plywood and set it atop that piece of the frame, making sure that the markings I had just made were face down. I also utilized some scrap lumber and some clamps to square up that piece of plywood with that portion of the 2x4 frame. From there I go ahead and use some wood screws to secure that piece of plywood to that piece of 2x4 framing. The little tool that I'm using in my drill here is called a countersink. And what this does is it drills a pilot hole for the screws so that the wood doesn't split, but it also bores out a little crater in the face of the wood so that the head of the screw can sit just underneath the surface of the wood. Since these two by fours are oriented differently than the ones on the bottom, I have one and a half inches of width to work with. Or in other words, I have one and a half inches of room to screw my screws into. I'm going to go into the center of those two by fours and measure three quarters of an inch over from the edge of the plywood and install my screws. You can see here that one of the heads of these screws actually broke off and that's okay. I just went ahead and screwed a screw next to it. Once those two pieces were joined together with those fancy, fancy wood screws, I then flip that structure over on top of the two by four bottom. And if you have some astute observation skills, you may have already noticed those pencil lines that I made a few steps ago. These markings are a very clear indication of where I can install the screws that will attach the plywood floor to the bottom two by fours. I go ahead and install wood screws in between those markings and the top two by fours with the same countersinking method as before. So, at this point in the project, uh, the Laban cart was just wood. It was plain Jane wood. You know, that's not fun. That's not metal. So, <laughs> this is the part of the project where most people would probably think that I hate myself. Because what I'm going to do is a very laborious procedure involving incorporating spikes all over this cart. So I went ahead and got some spikes off Amazon and the way these work is that there's two halves to each spike. The backing is the male portion with a threaded post on it and then the spike itself is a female threaded piece. So the male post goes into the female spike if that makes sense. And these are typically used to stud clothing so that you'll have each piece of the spike on either side of the clothing. However, I'm not using them for those, obviously, so I needed to figure out a way to install them on the wood. And the way I achieved this was by drilling out shallow holes into the wood where I could embed and glue in the backing for those spikes. What I'm using here to drill these shallow holes is called a brad point bit. And I really like these because they have a point in the center of the bit so that it eliminates a lot of the guesswork of where that center of the hole is going to be. Once I found the appropriate depth in which I needed to drill these holes, I set the stop on my drill press so that 
each of my holes would be a consistent depth. And if you don't have a drill press, you could do this by hand, but just make sure that your holes are as straight as possible. This next part is completely optional, but the way that I determined where each spike was gonna go was by measuring out the wood and doing some math to make sure that I could make the most of the real estate on the lumber that I could. I then used a pencil and kind of created what looks like a grid, and at each point where the pencil lines intersect with each other is where I will be drilling holes. I know what you're thinking to yourself, and you know, I really didn't think about it when I recorded this shot, or you know, that goes for, I guess, a lot of shots in this video, which is putting the camera on my right when I'm right-handed. So there will be some not so glorious shots of uh, my armpit and such in this video, and I apologize in, in advance for any of these shots. <laughs> I then took each piece of wood to the drill press and proceeded to burrow out each of the holes for the spikes. Something I didn't mention before is that I put a quarter inch border around where the screws will be embedded into the wood. That way I'll have some wiggle room as far as getting everything fit together and, you know, sanding and things of the such. And you cannot tell me that this footage is not satisfying to watch. Just the amount of holes and the precision. It's just, I don't know. It's just so, it's just so amazing. It's like gold. It's just great. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's just something about it, man. Oh my gosh, would you look at that? I stopped being a dum-dum and put the camera on my right. <laughs> I mean, left. I had it on the right, and then I put it on the left now. But uh, yeah, you can see, going back uh, to talking about the Brad Point bit, how vital that was to getting each of these holes for the spikes precise. By having that little tip in the center, I could align that with each of the pencil marks on the grid, so that each spike was spaced perfectly. So here is a killer shot of all of these holes that I ended up drilling into the lumber. And if you're one of those people with trypophobia, then I'm sorry, but this, this footage is probably just horrible to you. For those of you unfamiliar with the term trypophobia, it is the disgust or the aversion to clusters of small holes or irregular patterns. So, uh, you know, imagine that you actually watch some weird chameleon guy making some weird thing and learn something completely unrelated and new. And, uh, you know, I just I educated you guys and uh, I'm, I'm proud of it. But anyway, you might be thinking, how many holes did you drill, dude? And you know what? I just did the math, which I didn't do at first because I didn't want to discourage myself. But the math <laughs> equates to 404 holes in total. What fun. Kind of reminds me of the time I made like 180 screens for that DIY rack. You know, that's the, that's the Dylan self-loathing I was mentioning earlier. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> I then uh, sanded the entire project uh, with 120 grit sandpaper. I used a combination of hand sanding, and then I also used an actual tool that holds the sandpaper to sand the project. Now, if you don't have one of these tools, you could always just tape the sandpaper to a piece of wood and create a sanding block that way. And then for the beveled edges of the wood, I used a piece of 120 grit sandpaper attached to a scrap piece of wood. And the reason for this is because if I were to hand sand these edges and clean them up that way, then it would make it rather challenging to actually keep those cuts nice and even. By using this little stick with sandpaper on it, it ensures that I keep that 45 degree bevel consistent throughout the edge of that piece. After about 90% of those pencil marks had been removed from the faces of the wood and after I had cleaned up those beveled edges, 
I then had the issue of sandpaper dust building up in the holes that I had drilled. So I attempted to use a little file to get out all of the sanding dust, uh, and that kind of worked. Uh, it was, it just took forever, and it wasn't really that effective. So then I tried using an old toothbrush. And once again, that took a long time and wasn't super effective with getting out all of the sanding dust. So then it occurred to me, a really, really good idea. And this idea was to get my pump sprayer for the cams and empty all the water out of it and then use that as a pressurized air blower thing, my Bob, you know, like a air compressor thing that people use in their wood shops that I don't have to go ahead and get out all of that sanding dust. And it worked phenomenally. It just so happens that all of my magical cleaning elves are on strike and are refusing to clean up after any more of my crazy projects. So I ended up taking the remaining pieces outside to dust them off. For this next part, I was a bit torn about whether or not to install the spike backings now or after the project was painted. As you can see, I did choose to install them now and I'm glad I did. If I were to have painted this project first, there would have been the possibility of the paint filling in those holes and making the spike backings not fit properly. Also, by gluing them in now, the glue had a good chance to soak into the fibers of the wood. In addition to all that, it would have been very, very difficult to get these spike backings hammered in to an already built Laban cart. But anyway, I ended up using some E6000 glue to go ahead and glue these in. I really, really liked this glue because it was very forgivable. It's not brittle in the same way cyanoacrylate superglue or epoxy are. And the few times that I've accidentally dislodged a spike, the glue didn't take the fibers of the wood with it. So yes, once I had dabs of that glue in the holes, I then hammered in those spike backings. I did the best I could to get each post at a 90 degree angle with the lumber. One method that really helped ensure that these posts were as perpendicular to the lumber as possible was by holding the wood up to one of my eyes and just looking down the side of that wood to ensure that each one was as straight as possible. For any of the posts that weren't quite perpendicular with the wood, I just used a little jewelry hammer to get those placed properly. Luckily, being that this glue is flexible, when I screwed on the spikes, the glue was able to adjust accordingly for any not perfectly straight screw backings that I had installed. Whew. That was, that was, that was, that was a bit of work, but nonetheless, it was satisfying. So, you know, sometimes I just don't realize what I'm getting myself into before I uh, go ahead and start it. So. Now that we've moved on past that, it was time for me to go ahead and glue up this shell. And I did this by using wood glue. I started off gluing this together and trying to glue it together, doing all eight shell pieces at once. That's all four sides and all four pieces of the top. And it was rather difficult to clamp those all together at once since I was applying clamping force and different directions that were antagonistic to each other. What I ended up doing that worked the best was clamping the four side pieces separately from the four top pieces. For the four side pieces, I used the main body of the cart as a guide to clamp against so that once the sides were dry, I knew that they would fit around the body. I clamped the sides together with wood glue and strap clamps. Then for the top, I clamped those together again with wood glue and strap clamps. Unfortunately though, I did not get it on camera, so you'll just see that I have a glued together top piece already together. Before gluing the top pieces to the side pieces, I took some sandpaper to the glued together top pieces and just evened out where those mitered corners met. <laughs> 
This ensured that each part of the beveled edges of those top pieces would make contact with the beveled edges of the side pieces, enabling the glue to fuse together the pieces at as many points possible. After about 24 hours, and when the glue was dry, I went ahead and tested my plastic container and made sure that it fit in the shell and the base, and it did. And why am I doing that twice in the video? I don't know, but, uh, you know, let's just act like I'm not an idiot for a second. <laughs> okay, m moving on. Up to this point in the project, I thought I had been making a Laban cart for the chameleons, but somehow I was completely mistaken because what I had actually made was a little box for this psychopath here. You know, the psychopath being my freaking cat. Sometimes I swear, I think she thinks that she's a chameleon. I, I really am perplexed by her at times, but uh, you'll end up seeing her throughout a lot of this video because she really, really liked what I was making. But anywho, back to the matter at hand. I used some wood filler to fill in any of the gaps where the wood pieces met. And then following that, once the wood filler was dried, I then sanded down the edges of the parts, the, I sanded down the parts of the shell that protruded too far. That, you know, I, I what I'm trying to say is I made everything even with some sandpaper. So, yeah, why can't I, why couldn't I just say that? Why couldn't I have just said that? I don't know. There I go again, trying to over explain things. <laughs> Once I did that, I then flipped over the shell and filled in the places where the pieces met and joined together. And not that they were uneven, but in case they were, I wanted to make sure that those areas were filled. Call me OCD, but I just wanted to ensure that once this was painted, there was no areas where any humidity or water could soak up into and ruin this project. Alrighty, so, uh, excuse the particularly tragic camera angle here, but uh, what I needed to do next was cover each of those little posts that I had glued into the wood. And the way I did this, or at least started to do this, was by taking some painter's tape and looping it around itself, and then placing each one of those loops around the outsides of the posts. And though this did work, it just was super, super tedious. And then I came up with a great idea, which was to use some extra quarter inch tubing that I had laying around from my Mist King misting systems. And since the little holes that I had drilled for those posts was a quarter inch, and since the post bottoms sat below the surface of the wood, little pieces of the tubing actually fit really perfectly uh, in the top of those holes. This was a really good way of covering the posts whilst being pretty efficient. So I went ahead and used my tubing cutter to cut many, many, many pieces of this tubing and then press them into place. Since I was able to remove and reuse these pieces of tubing, I would paint one side and then take all of the little pieces off and then apply them to the next side that I was painting. Call me Captain Obvious because the next part of the project was to paint it. The type of paint I'm using here is a gloss black acrylic enamel. I use a combination of different brushes to apply the paint to this project, I started off by using a normal paintbrush 
and applying the paint that way and getting in all the nooks and crannies and then following that up with a little craft foam roller that I picked up from the craft store and using that to smooth out all the brush strokes. I would really like to say that this worked out phenomenally, but it didn't. And as with many aspects of my projects, things tend to throw me a curveball. And this was one of those situations. I attempted to use a regular foam brush to avoid brush strokes and then followed that up with a trim brush, which is essentially a foam roller with a tapered edge. I even used some scissors to cut down the craft foam roller to fit in between the tubing. No matter what brush I used, the tubing would want to stick to it and pull out of the place it was lodged into. I did the best I could under the circumstances. However, I still got paint on a lot of these posts, which it you know, wasn't actually detrimental to the project itself and I was able to work around it. And why am I explaining all this to you instead of just simply explaining that I painted the project? It's because if anybody does decide to incorporate spikes into any sort of project they want to do, they'll know what not to do through my screw ups. Look, I'm so nice, aren't I? <laughs> From there, I went ahead and painted the base of this Laban cart, which was a breeze in comparison to the shell. And for this, I used the same black high gloss acrylic enamel. After I gave the paint ample time to dry, which was about after 24 hours, I went ahead and added casters to the base of the cart. Now these are just cheap boys from Harbor Freight and they're rated at a 250 pound load capacity. So if you're going to use casters, just make sure that they'll be able to support whatever kind of weight that they'll be taking on. So then I went ahead and drilled some pilot holes and I put a piece of tape around the bit, which indicated how long the screw was so that I wouldn't drill the holes too deep. One reason I do suggest drilling pilot holes aside from, you know, potentially splitting the wood without them is to determine whether or not you'll be drilling or screwing into places where screws are already installed into the project, which is exactly what happened here. I actually found that I was trying to screw the casters over one of the areas where I had put a pocket hole screw when I assembled the two by fours. So I simply moved it down and out of the way of those screws. And at this point in the project, I had a new fun wheelie sled thing that I really wanted to take down the steepest hill in my neighborhood. But, you know, I didn't do it because I probably would have did a die and you know, uh, who would have taken care of the cams. Any hoozle. I then noticed that the final paint job on the shell was complete shite. It had a really uneven finish and I could not live with it. The main reason that the sheen came out uneven was due to the inconsistent coating of the paint. So then it came down to actually having to tape each post. So I tore off pieces of tape and then attached the two ends together, which created a loop and then wrapped that loop around each post and then cut off the excess tape so it would not interfere with my paint job. And instead of going back and trying to reapply the paint with a paint roller, I decided to use black lacquer, which I should have just done in the first place and I was actually going to do and I should have trusted my gut. Now, if you're a pro painter and you're watching this and you're thinking to yourself, you can't mix lacquer and enamel because of the chemicals and blah, 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 blah. I actually had a conversation with our Lord and Savior Google who is going to kill all of humanity one day and rule the world, if it was okay. And the, 
Google said it was just fine. And you know what? It did end up turning out just fine. <laughs> so typically, the way I will do spray lacquer is by spraying on a few coats and then sanding or buffing out any particles or bubbles in that last coat and then adding one more subsequent coat. So I proceeded to use 320 grit sandpaper to start prepping this surface for one last coat of spray lacquer. And I actually really ended up liking the way this was looking. It looked really distressed and just beat up. And I don't know, it just, it looks super sick. And I decided to keep it this way. So, you know, it has a lot of character and it brought out the grain. And, and I'm actually rather pleased that I messed up the initial paint job because I don't think I would have gotten this result had I had a perfect paint job the first time. And yes, the paint job is also silky smooth now. I was actually thinking about taking it a step further and getting some chains or hammers and things like that and beating up the wood to really make it look distressed. But I didn't wanna expose the wood in any areas, which could potentially lead to water damage. From there, I only had to screw on 404 screws. You know, no big deal. <laughs> but, uh, you know, anyway, I was able to hand screw on some of the larger screws that were on the top part of the shell. And then the smaller ones that were on the sides were a bit more difficult. So the ones that I couldn't screw by hand, I actually used some pliers to screw on. And then for the posts that actually got paint on them, I did my best to scrape off that paint and then used a pair of vice grip pliers to really grab onto those spikes and use that as a device to screw them onto the posts. While doing this, some of the posts did come out from being bumped or what have you, and luckily they're pretty easy to just glue back in. I've got just one simple question for you, the viewer. And the question is, do you think this project is metal enough yet? If your answer is yes, then unfortunately you're completely wrong. And what this project really needs is, well, if I told you that wouldn't be any fun, it looks like you're just gonna have to watch a little bit longer to figure out just how I'm gonna take this to the next level. In order to take the project to said next level, I needed to make some blood red paint. And weirdly enough, they don't sell blood red paint, probably because um, it's kind of weird, but you know, I'm weird. So, you know, I'll just make it myself. After many, 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 many trials of combining different colors to achieve a deep blood red, I was finally successful. I ended up using Deco Arts Americana line of acrylic paints in the colors Cherry Red, True Red, and then their Holly Green. The green was really great in giving it that bloody colored undertone. I also mixed in some Liquitex acrylic gloss medium to really aid in giving this paint a shiny wet effect once dry. And I will assure you that this paint is much more blood red than it appears in the footage. In person, it looks a lot less cherry red, especially once dry. You'll just have to trust me on this because I spent multiple hours perfecting this color, as you can see with all the different variations of red I have on this deli cup. To apply my disgusting red paint, I use a cheap old little paintbrush and tried to simulate blood spatter as much as I could. And yes, it is spatter, not splatter. Along with using aggressive whipping motions to get the majority of the paint on the shell, 
I also use my finger to pull back the bristles of the brush in order to flick some smaller specks of paint onto the shell. This way it just gave a nice contrast between the size of spatter. Something else I did too to really kind of make it look extra gory <laughs> was to use an extra spray bottle head that I had laying around to spray some paint on there. And this turned out really cool because it made the paint build up and drip. It also created a variety of lighter and darker red areas of the paint. Once that paint was dry, I then put the shell on the main body of the cart. I used a rubber mallet to really get it into place since it was a nice tight fit. Unfortunately for my mallet, this project was way too metal and it got dinged up pretty badly. But anyway, once that was in place, I then put the bin inside the cart just to make sure everything was still going as planned. Being that this project did take me a while to complete, I came up with some other ideas that I wanted to incorporate into it. One of those ideas was to integrate lighting. One aspect of my previous Laban, RIP that Laban, was that I had to just set lighting on top of it. And it was actually very annoying to move around and you know find somewhere to hang the light, yada, yada, yada. So I know ZooMed makes these light hangers as well as many other brands. And I actually at PetSmart found it on sale for like 17 bucks, which was I think 50% off. So I was like, I gotta find some way to incorporate that into the lay bin so that I can take off the lid with ease. So the way I decided to integrate that light stand was by getting rid of the bottom portion that usually sits underneath the terrarium and then just using the main body of it and cutting out a hole in the body of the cart where I could insert the body of that bracket. I needed to create a half inch by half inch square hole in the Laban cart for that light stand. And I did that by taking a half inch Forstner bit and drilling about as far down as I could with the drill press and then drilling the rest by hand and just did my best to make it as perpendicular with the body of the Laban cart. I then used some wood chisels to carve out that circle hole into a square hole until that light stand could fit into it. Essentially, I was just mortising this hole. If you're familiar with mortise and tenon joinery, then that's exactly, well, kind of what I'm doing here. To make that hole nice and square, I found it useful to tape a piece of 120 grit sandpaper to a file and go to town. I was actually rather surprised that I got the hole the perfect size the first time on this. And, you know, and once I got that in and it fit nice and snugly, I was just super, what the act, what? Why, why do I do this to myself? Why do I just, wow, that's, I know, I'm super attractive. But anyway, as I was saying, I was super thrilled that this fit snugly the first time and I didn't have to make any additional adjustments to that hole. Once the light stand was in place, I wanted to clean up the top of that hole and took some wood filler and filled in the gaps. Dude, look at this shot. It's it's so good. I, I, I don't know why, but it's so good. It's like super professional, man. After having chiseled this Laban cart and having moved it around when doing so, I noticed that the shell had shifted slightly and I wanted to make sure that it wasn't going to ever move. So what I ended up doing was screwing it into place and I did that by screwing from the inside of the cart. If you're familiar with the way drawer faces are installed, this is basically the method that I used. And just like with every other screw in the project, I decided to countersink these. Was it necessary? No, not at all. But is it pretty? Yeah, and that's what matters. 
at least to me. By the time I had screwed in that shell, the wood filler had dried, so I went ahead and removed my painter's tape and then used a file to clean up the ridges between the wood filler and the paint job on the shell. You'll notice too that I actually ended up removing one of the spikes to really clean up that edge of the wood filler. Once I cleaned that up, I took some black paint and painted over that wood filler, as well as the screw heads that were holding the shell in place. I went ahead and put the lay bin and its cart aside and then started to prep the lid for the lay bin. I marked out the part of the lid in the top that I planned to cut out and install screen into. Once I had made my markings, I used a hot blade to cut into that plastic. You could always use a plain old X-Acto knife to do this, but I really like the hot blades because it makes this part really freaking easy. From there, I cut out some black aluminum screen and then used hot glue to glue it into place. Whenever installing screen with hot glue, I find that the screen stays in place the best when sandwiched in between two layers of the hot glue. So what I do is put an initial layer of hot glue down one side at a time and then use my finger to really press that screen into the glue. Whenever I use my finger to press the screen into the hot glue, it dries fairly strangely to where the glue is not clear. In order to remedy that, whenever I apply the second layer of hot glue, I will use the tip of the hot glue gun to melt the top of that previous layer of glue so that it does dry clear. Another little idea I had was to find some way to wrap up the cord from the light so that it didn't drag around on the floor when I was moving the cart around. I had also been reminiscing on some lake trips that I had gone on in the past and recalled that whenever we would dock the boat, they would take the rope that was attached to the bow of the boat and wrap it around this little metal bar that was attached to the dock so that the boat would stay in place. I did some research and found that those little metal bars are called rope cleats. So I went and bought a small version of one and used some rivets to attach it to the Laban. This was the perfect solution to have a place to neatly wrap the light cord around. This next part is kind of self-explanatory, but I went ahead and put on the light and then used some zip ties to hold that cord in place along the light stand. I also needed a way to get the end of that light cord, the part that plugs into the wall, to stay in place. So I went ahead and glued a neodymium magnet to it. So then I could attach it magnetically to the light stand. The hot glue didn't do a very good job of keeping the magnet attached to the plug. And from what I could deduce, it was because each of those surfaces was very slick. So what I went ahead and did was use some 90 grit sandpaper to scathe up the surface of the magnet and the plug and reattached the magnet to the plug using some five minute epoxy. Next, I went ahead and got some 320 grit sandpaper and used that to blend the paint touch up around the light stand. Following that, I had glued the spike that I once removed to install that light stand back into place. And finally, I was at the end of the project and it was time to transfer the laying media from the deceased lay bin to the new lay bin in its fancy schmancy cart. However, there was one small issue. This fluffy psychopath did not want to get off the deceased lay bin. And so I essentially tried to take her on the Dumbo ride at Disneyland, but you know, she she just liked it too much and I, I really didn't know what to do so i just put the lid on the side of the container and all went well but when she noticed that i was taking away her lay bin she started to attack me i swear man she thinks she's a chameleon i just i, I don't get it <laughs> oh my god she's great she ended up finally going away and I was able to 
finish the transfer of the laying media. Once I did that, I noticed how badly I had screwed up the previous lay bin container. And don't worry, I did take into consideration that some of those broken plastic pieces could potentially be in the laying media. So I went ahead and found all those and took them out. After having transferred the laying media from the old bin to the new, this project finally came to a conclusion. Miraculously, my illness, my fever, had finally gone away. And yeah, I mean, it definitely wasn't a narrative that I made up for this video. I was, I was definitely sick, promise. Yeah, anyway, here's some good shots. For anybody that's made it to the end of this video, whether or not you watch the whole thing, I do appreciate you watching, and I appreciate you more if you watch the entirety of this video. I know the YouTube algorithm probably wants me to make like 10 or 15 minute videos, but I, I can't bring myself to do that. Whenever I'm making one of my projects for a general audience, I want to encourage people to be creative and make things of their own. And I know how it is to watch a 10 or 15 minute DIY video and be super confused and perplexed and have a million questions. However, if you do have any questions or you just want to ask me something completely unrelated to this project, go ahead and leave a comment in the comments below. And one more reminder, if you wouldn't mind subscribing to this channel and liking the video, it helps out tremendously, not just me, but other people as well. If anybody's in the market for a chameleon or has considered getting one, then I suggest you drop by MagicalCams.com where you can reserve one today. There's some beautiful red body blue bar envelopes that will be hatching in the next few weeks that are sired by Smog and damed by Akasha. And lastly, if there's anything else you need, then you can go ahead and reach out to me on Instagram, that's at MagicalCams, you can reach out via email, that's magicalcams at gmail.com, or you can reach out via Facebook, that's facebook.com slash magicalcams. Anyway, thank you for watching, and good luck with any super metal projects that you might delve into.